Morning, everybody. God bless North Carolina. Are we in South Carolina? No. Oh, good. Well, God bless North Carolina. I do this every year. Every year I do this, and I say the same story every year. Now, we do about 60 seminars a year, and it's our 27th year. You go to Texas, you say God bless Texas. I don't care if you're in Dallas or Corpus Christi. They're going to come out of their seat. They're going to yell and scream and holler, and it'll take you about five minutes just to get them to calm down. I said, I'm sure I'm glad you guys like Texas. And personally, I'm an Okie. The greatest thing about being an Okie is whipping a Texan. If we beat you, there's a God in heaven, and he loves us. And they don't know what to think about that. Anyhow, uh, they had a great week, <laughs> great week. We went in the bobbin across the great blue, man. It was something. You got used to it after about, after we got back. You got used to it after we got. Uh, I want to talk about something I talk to my kids about every year. I was sitting in the lobby of the hotel, and I, they got these books they put in every hotel lobby. And it's about Visit Raleigh, Visit Raleigh. And uh, what it says, says picture yourself. Picture yourself in Raleigh. Picture yourself having a good time in Raleigh. They got great pictures and places and all this stuff. They did a real good job. Well, that's what, that's what vision is. Uh, the greatest thing I've done as a parent, you got to plan a vision in your kids where they leave home or they won't leave home. <laughs> and the goal is for you to leave home. You are a gift from God. I'm to train you up and teach you, get you born again, spirit filled, and give you back to God. And then you're supposed to leave and be a blessing to somebody somewhere. And, uh, and so people have never quite understood that. I said, listen, uh, I love... Uh, the, the opportunity to be alive in the last days. For whatever reason, God has allowed us to be alive in the last days. God promised in the last days he had poured his spirit on all flesh. Our sons and daughters would prophesy. We'd dream dreams. We'd have visions. It is a great time. People challenge me all the time because I teach on parenting and uh, family. And, uh, and I remember we were going into a restaurant one time and uh, I had all the kids with me and the ladies taking our order. And uh, she said, all these yours? I said, what? She said, all these kids yours? I said, no, ma'am. I said, three of them are. We saw the other three on the side of the road that looked hungry. We just thought we couldn't get them something to eat. I said, yeah, they're all ours. And they'll ask, they said, well, you, are you Mormon? What? Are you a Mormon? No. Are you Catholic? No. We're backslidden Baptist. They said, well, why don't you have all these kids? Well, I don't want to grow by myself. I want somebody to, you know, come take me to dinner on Sunday and buy me a, a Winnebago and send me on a cruise. And uh, I told our kids their whole life, you owe us. I'm, I'm serious. You owe us good measure pressed down and shaking together running over. You owe us. And you think you leave home at 18? No, I'll chase you down. When I'm 90, I'll be chasing you down. Uh, you owe me. I've blessed you and birthed you and taught you how to talk and walk and dress yourself and pass out and get out of school and go to college, pay for your wedding, pay for your honeymoon, bought your first car, fix your crooked teeth. Ho, ho, ho. God bless you. <laughs> parents left for the children, children left for the parents. And, but I was going through this thing, and I realized something after my oldest daughter turned about 13. I think, I think I'm missing something. And so I think, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And I got to realize it's not what I'm putting in them. They need to have a vision to go somewhere on their own. It's not what I make you do. It's what you want to do. God said to give us the desires of our heart. What do you desire to do? And so even as a businessman, years in business and in the last 26 years in ministry, if I'm trying to counsel somebody, help somebody, what I do, I give them a blank piece of paper, and I said, I want you to write down God's plan for your life in two sentences. You can't write more than two. I want two sentences. What are you doing here on this planet? What are you doing here? I remember one guy came in. He just got lost his job. American Airlines. We got a big American Airlines in Tulsa. Just lost his job. White collar. Big paycheck. He's got a problem. He can't afford his house. He's going to lose his house. His kids are going to have to come out of college. Uh, it's about to get rough. <clears throat> so he comes by. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. So what's God called you to do? He said, uh, and he tried to explain, well, I'm a CEO at American Airlines. No, no, no. What's God called you to do personally? He said, well, I'm going to say, no, I didn't ask you about your job. What has God called you to do? What are you, what are you doing here on this planet? You're not an accident. Nobody's an accident. God saw you coming. God knew your name before your mother ever met your father. God has a plan for your life. You know what it is? And most people don't. So the greatest thing I've ever done in all the years is minister. So get a blank piece of paper, write down what God's called you to do. And people just stare at you. Well, I don't know. Sure you know God's not deaf. He's talking. He's been talking to you since you left your mother's womb. God's been talking since you left your mother's womb. Dording your steps, directing your paths, guiding you to all truths, sitting labors across your path, talks to me, wake up, talks to me, go to sleep. God, God's talking all the time. You got two ears. Do you hear anything? Well, if you don't, so I'm just be still and know that I'm God. Then you need to shut your yap up and go somewhere in the closet, shut the door, and just don't say anything. Now, men can do that, ladies. We can. We, you know, really. Your wife asks you, what are you thinking? I, mean, I said, nothing. Well, you got to be thinking something. No. 
Well, I'm not thinking nothing. Now, medically, men can do this, ladies. They can go somewhere and just, what are you, what are you thinking? Nothing. I'm in neutral. <laughs> so you worried about something? Mm -mm, nope. You look like you're worried. Well, I'm not. You sure? I don't know. Maybe I am. Do I look worried? You know. <laughs> so this is a stack of papers that I keep in my file drawer. I've raised all six kids on this stack of papers. So these are my notes. I carry this when I do a vision thing. And I'm just going to read a few of them for each one because Proverbs 29, 18 says, well, there's no vision the people perish. What are you doing here? And I'll do it with my kids every year, family vacation. Two sentences. We go, where are you going to be next, this time next year? And I remember one of them said, well, I'm, I'm in the fourth grade. I'll be in the fifth grade. Okay, write that down. You know, what are you going to do the year after that? I'll be in the sixth grade. So I'd make them write down a five-year plan with two sentences. Write it down. The Bible says, write the vision, make it plain. Because it's going to tarry. It's not going to happen right now. God's warning Israel. They've been sinning. Judgment's coming. And he told Habakkuk, tell the people, write this vision. Because I'm going to tell you what's about to happen. You've not been living right. Nasty's coming. So he said, write this vision down. Why? It's going to happen. It's going to tarry. You think it's not going to happen. But no, God will watch over his word to perform it. It's going to tarry. But it's going to happen. Write the vision. Well, I say in the possible way. Write the vision. What do you want to do in life? Well, it never looks right. I remember when I was in school, I took F's on all oral book reports in elementary, junior high, high school, and college. I didn't talk to anybody, and you can't make me. He said, well, what, well, it's oral book report, and I'm not giving one. And I remember my, my college professor when I was at University of Tennessee, I signed up for oral composition. I didn't know what it was. I don't know what oral composition is. I don't even know what that means. I'm from the country. We don't even know what oral composition is. Well, that's a freshman English. I signed up, so we give speeches. I said, I don't give speeches. What did you sign up for? It was the only freshman English left. And so, well, you got to give speeches. I'm not going to do it. He said, well, I'll flunk you. Go ahead. I've been flunked before. It doesn't bother me a bit. <laughs> and he didn't give me an F. He gave me an incomplete, which was worse. And so, so let's go through this process. I'm going to pretend you're my kids. It's the first of the year. I've got this stack of papers. I've had it for decades. And so, I'm not going to read all these. Just read you this. Give me the second scripture. I like this. Uh, Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Now, I got friends I went to school with. Just had dinner with a couple of my buddies that I graduated high school with over 50 years ago. Them and their wives. We got to reminisce and stuff. And we got to talking about, you know, when we got out of high school, we had a vision for nothing. What do you want to do? I want to just get out of school. That's my vision is to get out of school. Lord, how much I'm trying to get out of school. Well, then the Vietnam War was winding down, and they still had the draft. So the draft came out, and me and my buddy, we were going to join the Air Force. And he was number 284, and I was number five. So he called me up. We're watching TV. Oh, man, I'm number five. Lord, have mercy. I almost won. And, uh, and he called me on the phone and said, hey, I'm not going. No, we're going on the buddy plan. We're going to join the Air Force. We'd already gone down to take the physical in Atlanta. No, he said, I'm not going. I don't have to go. Yeah, we're going on the buddy plan. No, I'm not going. You're going by yourself. So I thought, well, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> and so I waited until my draft notice came. I said, anyhow, I get back out of the service. And so you used to do four or five basic things in life as a country boy. You get out of school. You get out of the Army. You get married. You know, uh, you find a job. And then you wait till you die. Well, I'm 20. I've already done the first four. I've got life pretty well whipped. And so I get married, and you realize something, you know, marriage is not what you thought. Uh, I thought it was like deer hunting, you know. We don't go deer hunting. We're trying to find, I'm going to find me a good-looking deer. And I'm going to shoot it, hang the head on the wall, put the meat in the freezer. I got mine. I hope you get yours. Because when you're dating, you work with yourself a lot. But after you get married, I don't have to work anymore. I got mine. Well, no, that's when you got to work a lot, and nobody told you. And so, you know, three years into my marriage, we're ready for a divorce. And so my best friend I was eating dinner with, Last week, he said, uh, he was joking. So I remember when, you know, we asked him one time, what's wrong with your marriage? I said, I married a she-bear from hell. <laughs> and he said, well, she sure is pretty. I said, yes, she is. And the devil's good looking too. Did you ever read that in the Bible? <laughs> and so I realized you don't find a great marriage. You have to build one. Jesus didn't find a church. He built a church. So you got to work on building something. But if you don't start getting still every now and then and just thinking, let's let God talk to you. God, what do you got for me to do on this planet? It's not based on my GPA or, or my IQ or my test scores. It's based on God. Uh, I collected 1,206 biographies when I was a school administrator. People that became millionaires and billionaires that never graduated from school. Most never got out of elementary school. But they were millionaires and billionaires. Why? They had a vision for what they wanted to do. Where there's no vision, even the unbeliever knows, where there's no vision, you perish. What are you going to do? Well, I'm just trying to get through another week. Thank God it's Friday. Trying to get through another week. Thank God it's the weekend. Well, that's not a vision. What are you trying to do? I only come, th listen, we go through life one time. It's a one-time process we go through. There's no second run. 
we, God gave us 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this planet. I will, I will have rewards for all of eternity based on what I'm doing in my life here on this planet. There's no time in heaven. There's time here. So I realized, I need to get busy doing something. So when I was in the country, uh, we always had funerals at the house. We had an embalmer, but we did not have a, a funeral home. And so if somebody died, they brought them to the house. You know, they died, you take them out, they, you know, fix them up real good. And they bring the casket to the house, people carry it into the living room, you shove the couch out of the wall, and, and you would raise the lid up, and we would set up with the dead. You set up all night with the dead. People bring food, potato salad, baked beans, fried chicken. You'd sit up all night with dead people. You talk about them. You talk good for a while, and then you realize dumb stuff. No, they weren't good. They're no good, sorry, North Carolina, I'll tell you right. You know? And so by the time the sun came up the next morning, you said every good and bad thing you could think of, and you're ready to stick them in the ground. It really helped the grieving process. But I remember when I went to my first funeral, I went over to, and, and it's a great aunt of mine, you know, and, and, I, and I thought, man, she, she looked like a $2 street walker. They got her painted up. And she never wore makeup, and they got her painted up like a clown or something. And, and, and that, she doesn't look like that. And so my parents would always say, well, go over and tell her bye. Hey, you got to touch the dead people. I couldn't have been a priest in the Old Testament. Touch more dead people than you can imagine because dad had a big family. So going, I remember, t- 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 man, hell, I'm touching her. And like, bye-bye, Aunt Ellen. So when I touched her, she was hard as a rock. I said, well, they froze her or something. What did they do to her? And, uh, and I got to thinking, I was seven years old. I'm at my third funeral at the house, my grandmother's house. And I'm thinking, you know, one day this is going to be you. You just got one shot through this thing. And I thought, man, I might want to get busy living because every day that goes by is a day you don't have. You lose. I thought. So I got myself a vision for my life at age seven by going to my third funeral and touching dead people. Like, hmm, got to get a plan. I need a plan because I don't want to up here. And so it began the process. So you go to my website and you'll find all these scriptures that I have on vision. They're really good. So I wrote them down. And then I collected the biographies. I looked this for my kids. Uh, this is sort of the short version of it. Um, you know, every woman knows, you know, you don't get pregnant at age 90 unless you're Sarah. You know, no, there had ever been a boat before. So Noah has God to build him a boat. He didn't know what a boat is. There's not a lake. And there's no rain. All of a sudden, big water's coming. God's a visionary. God's going to talk about things you've never seen, you've never dreamed, you can't imagine, but he's going to ask you to do them. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. I'm too dumb. And we always make excuses because people hate being made, in, made fun of. The devil hits us when men, we leave our mother's womb. And you'll hear it from your adults. Man, you're dumber than dirt. I'll be glad when you leave my house. Man, you're not going to mount the hill of beans. I saw hill of beans one time in Sykes, Missouri. A hill of beans, soybean plant. It was huge. I thought, that's what my daddy was talking about. Right there, that's the hill of beans he was talking about. Um, I've shared this story several times. Uh, Harvard has the greatest master's program in business in the world. You go to Harvard University, uh, they got a master's in business. It is number one. And so they wanted to main, make sure they could maintain it. So they hired a company out of Wisconsin. Come survey all of our students, and uh, we want to make sure we can maintain this. What's going on? How can we draw them? Why did they come? We never bothered to ask them. We're just trying to fill a new class up. What did they come here before? And so they went and interviewed everybody. And so what they realized, most of the people that came to Harvard's business school, the most expensive master's program in business in the world, and they asked all of them. And there's hundreds of students. Why did you come to Harvard? I mean, why did you come here? What are you going to do when you get out? And so 84% of them said, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? What are you going to do when you get out of the most expensive business school in the world? I don't know. We're just trying to get out right now. Zippo, no vision. 84% had no vision. 13% said, what are you going to do when you get out? I said, well, I've got some plans. 13% had a vision, but it wasn't written down. 3% had a vision, and they had it on them. What are you going to do when you get out? Well, i got it written down here in my bill. I'm planning to do this and do this. They came back 10 years later, interviewed all those same students. They're now out. They're out in the workplace. Interviewed them all again. And so what they realized... The 13% that had a vision were making twice as much as the 84% that had no vision. Well, there's no vision, you perish. What are you going to do in life? I'm just trying not to get laid off. I'm just trying not to get sick. I'm trying to get no Ebola or whatever new disease is coming up. I'm just trying to stay safe. That's no vision, people. We're supposed to take dominion, subdue. God had a vision for Adam. Man, when Adam came along, take dominion, subdue, name everything. All right. He said, what are you going to do? I got stuff to do. I got a vision. I'm king tut of this planet. Well, the guy watched him for a while and said, well, you need help. Bless your heart. You know, it's probably too big for you. I'm going to make you a helper. So you lay down there and take a nap. So Adam took a nap, woke up missing a rib, and in front of him was a centerfold of life. Whoa. God said, I thought you'd like that. And Adam and Eve, they went off to fellowship that day. They didn't milk any cows or feed any camels. 
How you doing? How you doing? What's that? I don't know. What's that? And they figured it out. You'll get it about lunchtime. <laughs> now, historians say by the time of the flood, there were over 8 billion people on this planet. They lived to you know, be 900 years old, and they're dropping babies like rainwater. Who's this? That's my kids, my grandkids, my great-grandkids, my great-great. And I don't know whose kids these are. I don't know. <laughs> Big family. The problem is they'd, lock, they'd left God, and they weren't following God anymore. Anyhow, the Harvard thing came back. The 3% of the Harvard people, if they got the master's degree, the 3% who had a vision, had it written down, had it on them, you can't believe this, were making 10 times more than the 97% combined. Why? Well, there's no vision that people perish. Even Harvard knows that. We're the people of God. We do. I'm here on purpose. I don't care if I don't know who my, I don't care if they found me on the doorstep of an orphanage. I did not shock God when I popped out. God saw me coming. He's going to order my steps, direct my paths, guide me to all truth, surround me with the shield of divine favor. People in light me not even know why. It's not my IQ. It's not my GPA. It's that I know God. The Bible said in Acts, we perceive these ignorant and unlearned men. They're writing about the apostles. We perceive these ignorant and unlearned men have been with Jesus. We know about them. They're not normal. They've been with Jesus. Is it their IQ? No, but they've been with Jesus. Was it a degree? No, but they've been with Jesus. They're not normal. Laying hands on sick, casting out devils, raising the dead. They're not normal. You become like who you hang around. That's why we're in the most powerful thing on this planet this morning, the local church. There's nothing more powerful than the body of Christ. And we're part of it. And we're all different. There's no two people here the same. There's no two thumbprints that are the same. No two voice prints are the same. God is a creative God. I mean, I used to mess with the high school kids. You know, when God made the animal kingdom, he got real creative. You know, he made, a, he made an orangutan. You ever seen an orangutan? Weird looking thing. We go up to the zoo and they got, we go to the ape section. They got big apes and monkeys and orangutans, chimpanzees. Well, it's one orangutan. He's got no hair on his rump. It's like all of a sudden God created everything. So, oh, come back here, orangutan. And he shaved the hair off his rump. Mm. All right, you can leave. Oh, come back here. One more thought. And then he painted it fluorescent pink. There is a monkey with no hair on his rump, fluorescent pink. Now, that'll get you some jokes in elementary school, I guarantee you. God did that on purpose. God made the bombardier beetle. I love this. National Geographic. I've got this film somewhere. I've got it buried in the garage. I've got to find it. I watched the National Geographic film about the bombardier beetle who eats wheat grass. He's got two eyeballs sitting on top of his head. One that looks forward, and the other he can look behind him at the same time. His eyeballs are in turret, so he can look two different directions. And he loves to eat wheat grass. When he eats wheat grass, he produces a gas. He's like a long grasshopper. When he eats that wheat grass, he produces gas, two different kinds of gas in his body. And he's got two cylinders in his little hind, he said. And so all of a sudden, he's eating wheat grass. Join the wind. All of a sudden, a praying mantis, I'm not making this up, and that's geographic. A praying mantis sees, ooh, lunch. Big bad praying mantis is going to eat some lunch. Comes at that stem, going to eat that bombardier beetle. By the time he bites down on him, the praying mantis sees him coming. He, he releases gas. When he has gas and he releases it, it produces a, a three inch flame. <laughs> Swaying in the wind. <laughs> and the praying mantis' head just disappeared. You need to order that. It is, if you don't have anything to do, sit down one night. Hey, we're watching the praying man. Let's get his head blown off tonight. God has an incredible sense of humor. I've told my kids, it's not what you make good grades, but it's not your GPA or your grades. You know God. Are you listening to him? Have you heard his voice? So I give you this, and I like this right here. Uh, God, you know, bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. You know, he's going to take them to the promised land, live in houses you didn't build, eat from vineyards you didn't plant. Well, he's trying to get them to use their faith because they've been slaves for 40 years. So he takes the bitter water, no water, no food. God does 10 miracles on the way to the promised land. And they're gripping the whole way. They're complaining and they're gripping and they're gripping. And all of a sudden, they go into the promised land. They come back out. You know the story. 12 spies go in. 10 come back with an evil report. Two come back with a good report. Yeah, there is the promised land. There's houses you cannot imagine. We got great societies be ahead. It is a great country. But there's giants in the land. And we look like grasshoppers and they're hot. And we're tiny. I don't know if the ask questions. Hey, what do I look like? You look like a grasshopper. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go back and report that. <laughs> and they come back and so they have an evil report. And so the people begin to complain. Oh, if we'd only died in the wilderness. Oh, if we'd only gone back. Oh, I remember the good old days. I remember the good old days. There are no good old days. Lest I grew up in a family. My dad was the youngest of 12 people. I heard more. I remember back in the 30s and the 40s, and I remember back in the 50s. It was a good old day. I taught history for 10 years. There never been any good old days. We're a bunch of doofuses. 
There are no good old days, man. There's all kinds of bad stuff. We're going from faith to faith and glory to glory. Tomorrow's the greatest day of our life. I get up in the morning, God's mercy is brand new. Get to start all over again. And so there are no, so anyhow, I like this. So here's what, here's what it says in number 16. As this is God speaking. He's mad. He's tried to, tried to bless them, tried to get the use of faith. They won't use their faith. Here's what he says in number 16. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I have heard you say. What? Now what they, what'd they say? I wish you were not dead in the wilderness. I wish you were still a slave. God said, fine, I'll give you what you say. Well, they panic. Do what? Yeah, I've been listening to you. I got recording angels. I'm going to give you what you say. Vision has to be declared. You got to start saying what you believe God is you to do. You don't have to brag to anybody. Go ahead and do. Well, I'm going to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. With a long life, God's going to satisfy me and show me his salvation. I grabbed that early. Now I'm the living, I'm the last living member of a big old family. Twelve aunts and uncles. Everybody's dead. I buried all my aunts, my uncles, I buried my parents, buried my sister, buried my wife. I buried everybody. I hope they're doing good. Well, I'm still here. People say, how long are you going to live? I'll be the last person off this planet. I've said this my whole life. I'm going into heaven, and I'm going to be the last person in. I'm going to tell you, hey, I locked up. I'm the last one out. We're good. <laughs> you think I'm joking? I'm not. I ain't leaving there. I'm going to I'm dirt under my finger. I'm the last one off this planet. People trying to get out of this early. I don't want to leave early. Because my reward for eternity is based on what I'm doing here, and I want to keep laying up treasure in heaven. I want to keep being a blessing to people. I want to be the salt. I want to be the light. I want to leave people better than I find them. What are you going to do? I'm trying to leave them better than I find them. So, well, I didn't bless myself. I love that. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is good. Uh, numbers chapter 6. I had three Catholic kids in my high school. We didn't know what Catholics were. There was no Catholic church in town. They went somewhere else. Uh, we're all Baptists or, or Pentecostals. And they'd always sign our annual the same way. Hmm. He said, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show his favor and give you peace. I, all the Catholic kids sign my annual every year like that. I thought, well, it's a Catholic saying. But I went to Bible school. It's not a Catholic saying. It's in Numbers. God said that. Here's what they said. And, of course, he's telling Aaron to write this. He said he this. He said, whenever Aaron, this is God speaking, whenever Aaron and his sons bless the people in my name, I will bless them. Whenever Aaron and his sons bless the people in my name, oh, God, when are you going to bless me when you say it? When are you going to bless me whenever you say it? God watched over his word before me. God, when are you going to be good to me whenever you say it? Now, you got to get it in your deep. Because I, I went through Canada for three weeks one time on a train, a bunch of Pentecostal churches. And when somebody asked me one time, I said, are you one of those name and claim it preachers? I said, what? Are you one of those name and claim it preachers? I thought, Yeah. Romans 10, 9 to 10 says, I got saved. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. He died for me. God raised from the dead. I confess it with my mouth, and I got saved. Did you feel anything? Uh uh-uh, but I got saved. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. God is my God. Gave me the Holy Ghost. Talks to me all the time. Talks to me when I get up, go to bed. He's always talking things. Am I listening? So I got to learn to get quiet. And then you got to learn to pray in the Holy Ghost a lot. You know, it's not, it didn't just make you a Pentecostal. People thought, well, let's go to church and pray in tongues a lot. Eh, that's all right, but praying in tongues for when you're by yourself. When you're driving in the car, mowing the grass, washing the dishes, doing the laundry, helping your kids pass algebra for the fourth time. Shonda. <laughs> you, think, you think I'm joking. Okay, we'll skip this. That's real good, but I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, thinking. I've got about three minutes left. When you have a vision, you need to write it down, and you want to watch what you think about it. You've got to guard your heart with all diligence for out of the issues of life. The Bible says, think on these things, whatever's lovely, honest, just, praiseworthy, good report. Think on these things. Don't think on those other things. What are you thinking? I'm thinking about how blessed I am. I don't care if I just got laid off. I've been there. Tw- I've been there twice. Dro- drove into my plant, and the guy met me at the gate with a pink slip. You don't work anymore. I said, sure, I work on the third floor. Got a good job. No, nope. they sold this company to a company in Belgium. And I told him, I don't want to go to Belgium. He said, don't worry, you're not going. They're taking the plant. They're not taking you. And we went out and protested, burned wood in the barrel for about three hours. And I thought, there's no future in this. I cannot go home and tell my wife, hey, what'd you do all day? Well, I lost my job, but I burned a lot of wood in the barrel. Carried the sign, protest. <laughs> no, I got to go find me a job. So I found the employment office and, uh, and I went in and he said, I said, I need a job. He said, well, you need to take a test. I don't take no tests. I need a job. We don't know what kind of job to give you. I have no job. I'll take a job. I'm not picky. I just need a job. And so they made me take a test. And this guy came out a few hours later. He said, well, Mr. Gibbs, based on the results of your test, 
you need a job, find you a job in one of these three areas, stay away from everything else. So according to the test, I could be good at three things. One of them was being an engineer. And I couldn't even spell engineer. Is there two E's or one in engineer? I don't know. <laughs> so long story short, it took seven years in high school, but I became an engineer. Had a great job before I went into ministry. Even a heathen that could test me said, well, you seem to be good at this. Well, I guess I am. And so what happens is you're in the body of Christ. You start serving other people. You'll find out what your gift is. But not until you serve somebody else. Because we get arrogant by ourselves. I'm good. I'm good. Well, just try it a while. And you think you can, you know, we used to pitch horseshoes in the family reunion every year. And I knew there was only one kid who could pitch horseshoes real good. And I made sure he was my buddy. Now, he was pierced every part of his anatomy. He had earrings, nose rings, cheek rings. He had rings through this cheek and this cheek. But he could pitch horseshoes. So family reunion, call you. he called, hey, hey, Mr. Gee said, we're going to be partners. Yes, son, we won that thing three years in a row. We're going to win it again. Family reunion, we're going to win the horseshoe tournament. And, uh, and he said this one year, he called, he said, well, now, Mr. Gee, I'm bringing my girlfriend with me. No problem. Well, I really appreciate you not judging me. No problem, son. Because, you know, other people have. But, you know, we're just kind of living together, and, and we like it like that. Praise God, son. We're just going to pitch horseshoes. And he said, he said, you know, what, what makes you so different? I said, I'm not different. I'm a Christian. He said, well, I appreciate you not judging. I said, son, listen, I'm not judging. You're going to burn in hell forever. You don't know Jesus. You're going to burn in hell forever. <laughs> we're just going to pitch horseshoes. <laughs> now, you think I'm joking. I'm very serious. He got real quiet. What? Oh, yeah, you're not saved. You're going to burn hell forever. We're going to pitch some good horses until you go there. You're my, you're my partner. He got saved at the family reunion. It was incredible. <laughs> I only got two minutes. Uh, I'll read this. This is Martin Luther. You know, Martin Luther, you know, nailed the 95 thesis on the door. Stopped being a Catholic, got himself married, and dropped a lot of babies. It was a real good story. This is in 1483. Here's what he wrote. Martin Luther, in 1483, wrote, he said, I am afraid that had public schools, even before there were public schools. I'm afraid that schools were proved to be the great gates of hell unless they did us through labor engraving the Holy Scripture upon the hearts of the youth. Every institution which is not increasingly occupied with the Word of God will and become corrupt. That's several hundred years. Would you know, if we don't keep them in the Bible, we're going doofus. We've got to get in the Word of God. Where you get a vision? Word of God. How you know what you're going to do? Word of God. Read your Bible. Your mind will start thinking good thoughts instead of stupid thoughts. Uh, Douglas MacArthur, you know, he tried to, he, he was a real famous general, you know. By the way, he flunked the entrance exam to get into West Point twice. He couldn't get in. He kept flunking. So his mother was determined. His dad was a, was a great, really good in the military. His mom told him his whole life, you're going to be just like your father. You're going to be a great man and a great leader. But he can't get into school. So his mom moved and took an apartment across from West Point. They moved from Texas, got an apartment, and she drilled him and grilled him on that entrance test. Third time he passed it. Third time he passed it. So when he became a general, he won the Medal of Honor three times. Ooh, that was a lot. Distinguished Service Cross three times. Army Distinguished Service Cross five times. Silver Star seven times. Bronze Star. Purple Heart three times. Distinguished Flying Cross. He won everything you can win multiple times. How'd you do that? My mother had a vision for my life. She declared it over me. I've told my kids. I've told them when they come home with F's on a on on report card. You're going to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Everything you touch your hand to is going to prosper. Teach doesn't like me. Shut your mouth. Teach. Everybody likes you. They just don't know it yet. You're a child of God. You're surrounded with the shield of divine favor. People like you. They just don't know it yet. You say what God says. Well, I'm blessed and highly favored. Yes, you are. Say it again. I'm blessed and highly favored. I can't get a day for the problem, but I'm blessed and highly favored. You say what God says. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the weak sound strong. Let the poor sinners call those things to be not as so they are. How'd you get saved? I said something in my mouth, believed it in my heart, and it happened. People said, how'd you get that traveling ministry? Well, I declared it. I said it. Now, 30 seconds. Jeremiah 29. Children of Israel are going into, you're going into slavery. They've been sinning, their parents are sinning, God sent them out. Jeremiah 20, 11, Jeremiah, write, the prophet writes a letter. Hey, when you get over there, I know your day's not going good. Your house is burnt down. They killed your parents. They killed your pet dog. God said, I didn't do this to you. You did this to yourself. I have no plans to harm you, you thumb sucking sinners. Message translation. <laughs> when you get over there, build houses, dwell in them, plant a garden, eat the fruit, find yourself a girlfriend, get married, drop some babies. 
Pray for the peace of the city I've caused to be carried away captive to, for in the peace thereof shall you have peace. Which is God's casting vision. I know your day's not going, man, my world's gone this all. What happened? Shut your face up. It's horrible. Shut your face up. You're a child of God. You're going to build a house. You're going to get married. You're going to get a good job. And then seven years, I'm bringing you back to rule and reign. Only, you know, all those young boys that got carried away, only Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed the word of God. Somebody slipped that scroll through the wall of the prison. They're in a prison. I mean, it's skanky. It's not that. And some, hey, psst, got a word from God for you. Slipped the scroll through and they said, build a house, dwell on, plant a garden, eat fruit, get a girlfriend, make your wife, have some babies. Pray for the peace of Babylon. Daniel, Daniel prayed for Babylon three times a day. Did you know that? They said three times, he prayed. Well, the people didn't like him because he was praying all the time. So they told the king, you got to make a statue. And you don't let anybody pray about anything except that statue. So Daniel, Daniel, he opens the windows, he's praying, and they told the king, the king brings him in. Are you praying? Yep, pray, pray every day. What are you praying? Well, I'm praying for you, big boy. <laughs> he did. He's praying, praying for you. Well, you can't do that. i got to throw you in prison. All right, do what you have to do. So they rolled the thing up, threw him in the prison with the hungry lions. And the king hated it because he liked Daniel. Man, he's a good kid. And so the next morning, he gets up real early, they roll the stone. Up. Hey, Daniel, are you still alive? Oh, yes, king, my God is more than able. So he got Daniel out of the cave and threw the other guys that accused him in, and they ate a good lunch that day. <laughs> God is not Tinkerbell. There's no magic wand. We live on an alien planet. Satan's the current God of this world. He steals, kills, and destroys. But we are children of God. We have the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit. What is it? We're in a war, and we've been promised victory, but we have to fight. What are you doing? I'm going to have victory, and I'm going to win. And I'm going to leave everybody better than I find them. Second Timothy, Paul's getting ready to go to heaven. He's writing a great letter. It's really good. He's writing that long letter. And he says this, you know, I've been beat more than anybody else. I've been beat with rods. I've been whipped. I've been stoned. I've been put in prison. I about froze death on the sea. It's a long, nasty letter. He's writing the Corinthian church because the Corinthian church is upset. And they wrote Paul, Paul, you got to come back. We've just gone crazy since you left. We need you. You got to come back. Everybody's getting drunk at communion. Yeah, they didn't have sissy cups. They had mugs. It was the real stuff. I'm, it's in your Bible. I'm not making this up. Everybody's getting drunk in communion. We got one of our guys shacked up with his mother-in-law. It's perverted. So Paul, you can read New Living Translation, my friend. So Paul, we need to pray. So some guys, we need to pray. They're having a hard time over there. He's at the church today, so let's get there. So they're getting holding the whole hands. Father, we just pray for this guy over here that's shacked up with his mother-in-law. We just turn his flesh over to the devil that his soul might be saved in the day of judgment. In Jesus' name, amen. And then he went about it and said, I'm sorry, I'm, well, Paul, what did we just pray? Well, we pray for this guy. What did we pray? Well, we turned him over to the devil that his soul might be saved in the day of judgment. What does that mean? Hell's coming. <laughs> we cut hell loose on him. <laughs> and he got saved, by the way. It's in the next Corinthian book. What are you going to do? I'm not going to pray some stupid thing over you. You need to get saved. You need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. We're going to pray for it because I love you. I don't want you to perish and burn in hell forever. God, Send labors across his path. His path. Talk to him when he goes to sleep. I mean, mess with him. I don't want him to be able to open the door. And say, hey, you need Jesus. I don't want him to walk into work. Hey, you need Jesus. I'm going to the bathroom stall. Somebody, you need Jesus on the bathroom wall. Father, what's going on? You're being chased. The love of God's going to chase you down. So, when you leave here today, I don't care who you're dealing with. Everybody's dealing with something. Everybody's dealing with somebody. Uh, you and I are the salt and the light. What are you going to do? I'm going to leave everybody better than I find them. Now, I can't make them listen. Jesus died for everybody, but not everybody received it. Uh, I like Raleigh. What do you picture yourself doing? This is your tax dollars at work, by the way. What do you picture yourself doing? I used to get on my kids. What do you see yourself doing? Now I'd make them every year. Give me two sentences. What do you see yourself doing five years from now? Write it down. Because if you don't start writing it down, you're going to be living with me when you're 40. And I don't want you to live with me when you're 40. I want you to leave home. I want you to go away. Move far away. I'm, I'm serious. I want you to get married and dump a ton of babies. Have grandbabies. And be a blessing to them. Be a blessing to your community. Why? We live in the greatest time of human history. Don't go to heaven with some thumb sucky sad song. We got it hard. It hard. My daddy left my mom. My mama didn't love me. My teacher wouldn't pass me. My coach wouldn't blame me. My dog bit me. You know, when I had family reunion, they had the main table, big main table. You, could, you didn't sit at the main table because you're a doofus. You sit at the card table. Now, I believe there are card tables in heaven. What's this? Well, this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm going to be sharing testimony. 
Where's my seat? Well, you're at the card table. Because you're a thumb sucky Christian. You grab the whole way here. Where's my reward? You don't have any. You get to hold the door of somebody else's mansion, but you don't have one yourself. But you get to stay. God bless you. Welcome to heaven. Because we're laying up treasure in heaven. Everything you do every day, the way you treat people that are nice to you, not nice. Every day you're laying up treasure. What are you going to do? I'm going to walk in love. Bless your heart. That's Southern for your stupid, by the way. Well, bless your heart. Well, bless your heart. Bless your heart. Now, I've had people get mad at me, trying to do what's right. And they get mad and point their middle finger and, you know, shove this and what this is. God bless you. God bless you. And they think you're messy. And it makes them mad. I've had people just get, but it, God bless you. Praise God. God bless you. Bless your heart. Go with God. Now, I've not had everybody, but I've had a third of them come back and repent and say, you know something? I got convicted. Yeah, I blessed you. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let's stand up. Vision, God's got a vision for everybody. But do you know what it is? So I do the same thing every time. I'll say it again. I get my kids every year, get a piece of paper. I want God's vision for your life in two sentences. What are you doing here on this planet? Because if you don't know, you're not gonna you're gonna be living me five years from now. And I don't want you to live me five years from now. I want you to get out and do something. I like the fellowship, I want to hang out, but you need to start chasing God. How do you think I got here? I chased God. I took F's on all oral book reports. Man, I mean, I was a mess. I went to college for one year and they wrote me a letter. University of Tennessee wrote me a letter saying I can never come back. I legally can never go back to the University of Tennessee. I can't for legal reasons. They're real. I can't go back. Why? Because I was a doofus. But I got filled with the Holy Ghost, got in church, got around the people of God, learned how to live right and talk right and pray right and do right. The Bible says the righteous fall seven times a day, but they get back up. We're not the perfect people. We're the getting back up people. So be patient with people. Be patient with them. Pray for them. Bless them. Man, yeah, bless them, Lord. They need help. Bless your heart. You need help. And bless your heart, too, while I'm at it. Well, bless your heart. If you start saying it, God will move. But if you start writing dumb stuff on the bathroom wall at work, God's not going to move. God's going to watch over your word to perform it. What are you going to do? I am a child of God. I am surrounded with the shield of divine favor. People like me not even know why. I've told people, I remember when they weren't, they were freezes on wages. I said, no, I'm going to get a raise. No, they froze. No. I, if nobody else gets a raise that's coming, they're going to give me one because I'm blessed. I'm a child of God. I'm the head and not the tail above and not beneath. I'm going to get a raise. I'm going to get promoted. They're not promoting anybody. They're laying off. No, I'm going to get promoted. Now, it's a long testimony. You can order it off my website. I blessed her where I went. Why? I said so. It's a war. What are you? I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm a child of God. Hell knows when I walk in the room. What's that? Oh, dear Lord, he's here. 